What the hell is Opabinia? It's one of the strangest fossil animals that we know of, with a combination of features that are seen together in zero modern animals. Things like a long elephant-like trunk, except with a claw at the end, and then it had five eyes and a series of strange limbs running down the length of the body. And all of this combined into an animal that was probably about the length of my finger, two or three inches, or maybe up to five centimeters. But all of this combined can't tell us exactly what it was. But Opabinia had its reasons for being weird. The Cambrian saw the rise of many different types of burrowing animals, and while burrowing may have been a defense against at least some of the predators around during the time, Opabinia's claw likely was used to reach under the sand and mud and find these burrowers. Unfortunately for Opabinia, though, there were also other predators evolving during this time, which is why it had these five eyes, with the two frontmost ones looking forward, the sidemost pair looking sideways, and the one square in the middle looking almost straight up. And this kind of arrangement for the eyes makes a lot of sense when you consider its hunting strategy. Things that are burrowing don't necessarily need to be looked for, because you can't really see that well beneath the mud. Additionally, you don't really need to look forward, because they're likely not going to be trying to flee. Instead, fleeing is likely something that Opabinia would be doing when it encountered some of the larger predators that it saw with these five eyes. Unfortunately, different ideas on the limbs of Opabinia have been proposed, with the first of these being that Opabinia would have had Lobopodin-like limbs and scuttled along on the seafloor. This also would place it closer to the Lobopodins, things like Hallucigenia and then by extension the Velvet Worms. The other idea, though, comes from one of its predators, Anomalocaris, which could have gotten up to a meter long, and definitely would have eaten an Opabinia if it had got the chance. Anomalocaris, though, had blade-like wings which it would have used in an undulating kind of pattern to swim through the oceans. And there is a chance that Opabinia, if closer related to Anomalocaris than to the Lobopodins, would actually have also had this trait. These kinds of animals which had these wings can be grouped together in a group called Dinocarida, and it's not necessarily a well-defined group because it actually might not include all of the descendants of the common ancestor of that entire group, Dinocarida, because it might be counting out the arthropods, what it seems most likely for now at least that Opabinia was most closely related to. Now, if Opabinia did have wings like this, the gills would have been built into those wings, meaning that they would have been moving through the water as the animal swam, giving it even more oxygen. However, if it was legged, these still would have had these side projections with the gills, meaning it still would have been getting plenty of oxygen. So we can't necessarily use just the idea of how it would have breathed as an idea for how it might be closer related to one of these groups over the other. However, it is important to note that when we are looking at the animals that are most closely related to the Anomalocaris side, that it's actually more closely related to things like the arthropods, which include some of the most numerous groups in the world today. Things like crustaceans, arachnids, and also the insects being that Anomalocaris and, by extension, Opabinia may be some of the best examples we have of what the common ancestor of all arthropods, again, the most numerous animals on the planet, may have been like. Because of some of the similarities between these potentially more wing-like structures in Opabinia and the definite wing-like structures that existed in Anomalocaris, it is at least more suggested right now that Opabinia is probably one of these more stem-line arthropod lineages rather than a stem-line Lobopodin lineage. However, this kind of ongoing process is also part of why Opabinia shows us so much about how evolution may actually work. In 1989, Stephen Gould wrote, We are awestruck by Tyrannosaurus. We marvel at the feathers of Archaeopteryx. We revel in every scrap of human fossil bone from Africa. But none of these has taught us anywhere near so much about the nature of evolution as a little two-inch Cambrian oddball invertebrate named Opabinia. Or if I want to paraphrase, yeah, sure, T. rex is neat and all, but look at this weird little Cambrian thing. Isn't it just so bizarre and so unique in how it helped he, Gould, and Niles Elridge propose the idea of punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium is the idea that rather than change in evolution taking place in very, very small amounts over a long amount of time, during most of that long time, almost nothing happens. The same evolutionary pressures are present on a species. But then a change happens, and in a very short amount of time, a lot of change for that species and that lineage happens. This is something that's very different from the idea of gradualism, which had been proposed before and which many people are most familiar with. Because of Opabinia's strange suite of features, which all developed so quickly after the Cambrian explosion, Gould saw this as hard evidence for punctuated equilibrium, that evolution can occur very, very rapidly. 
And while this idea isn't necessarily confirmed by most evolutionary scientists, it is still likely a part of the bigger puzzle of how evolution works. And so while Opabini itself was just a very, very small part of the evolutionary history of Earth, it has done massive, massive work in helping our understanding of how evolution does work. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. I want to give a shout out to our patrons who are Steve Black, Madeline Lockyer, and Sean White. Uh, thank you guys, I appreciate it so much. You guys can find more information about the Patreon down below in the description. So yeah, this is the new video series. Hopefully you guys liked it. If there's anything you'd like to see done differently, be sure to leave a comment so that we can try and work on it. Um, it'll be exciting to see this going forward, and if you do sign up to the Patreon, you might be able to help vote on what other topics we discuss during this series. So, there, is, there are some benefits for, for joining. You may have noticed I was wearing my Diabetes Saurus shirt for this video, and that's because this next upcoming month of November is Diabetes Awareness Month, and so if you do want to make any donations to any organizations, I highly recommend to Type 1 International. They are doing very good work of actually getting people the medication and insulin they need. With that in mind, everyone, be safe, take care, and don't go extinct.